What's up everybody, how's it going? It's Berk, aka Dancewait here, and welcome back to the Final Fantasy X Auto Battle Only Challenge. So, a long time ago I asked myself the question of can I beat Final Fantasy X using the Auto Battle function that the Steam version has? And it's been a hell of an adventure and so many of you guys have tuned in to watch it and it's been a really wonderful series so far. And yes, I did manage to complete the game with that. Now, we couldn't always use auto battle, but for a lot of the battles, especially a lot of the significant ones, we were allowed to use it. And it turns out that using that function or just using attack only is enough to beat this game. So in the last episode, I defeated Brass's final Aeon, defeated Yu Yevon as well, even though there was like an interesting little trick that almost caused me to fail that battle. Um, we have done it. And now, of course, I set my sights on loftier goals because there's still plenty of things that I could be fighting and defeating in Final Fantasy X with these restrictions. And I just had to know how far I could go. So this next episode is going to be me basically preparing and continuing on with more of like the side quest and optional battle areas for Final Fantasy X. So this will include, of course, not this specific episode like in its entirety, but what's still to come is going to be the Omega Ruins, where I'm going to try to fight Ultima Weapon and Omega Weapon. There is, of course, going to be the Monster Arena enemy, so like the Area Conquest, Species Conquest, Original Creations. And then, finally, it's going to be an attempt at the Dark Aeons to see if I can defeat any of them with these particular restrictions. So, without much further ado, let's get into it and see what happened in this run after I completed the story. As always, for this series, especially since it's been such a highlight on the channel, I really would appreciate if you continue to drop a like if you're enjoying the content and show the series some love so it can continue to do well, and I'm looking forward to bringing you more stuff like this in the future. Let's get into it. So as always with these things, I fired up my save before I defeated Brass's final Leon. And it's time to sort of take a look at things and decide where to go from here. Now, one of the most difficult things that could potentially sort of hinder this challenge is the acquisition of certain items and equipment and things like that. Because something that might be very necessary for one specific battle, you might be able to set up like a specific armor or a weapon for that. But then you might need something different that also has very high level requirements and you would have run out of the item. So let's say in this particular challenge, you do the monster capturing and you're only allowed to get one auto haste. So you can see why that's gonna cause big problems moving forward. Now, very quickly, I decided it was a good idea for me at this stage to at least get the celestial weapons to get me rolling on that front. More often than not, in this particular challenge, having the celestial weapons was gonna be the best choice. And so I thought to myself, might as well get those ready because my characters were strong enough to start breaking the damage limit and once you're fighting enemies that have hundreds of thousands of HP and, well, millions of HP, doing just quad nine damage is not really going to be enough in this particular challenge. So that's the first thing that I set my sights on. So before even heading to Omega Ruins, I thought, let me get these Celestial Weapons. Now, with this, it's another one of these ones where what you normally do in any given playthrough versus what you do in this challenge is different. And depending on how much thought you actually put into it and how much you strategize in advance, there's probably more interesting ways to do it than you think. Now, with me, every playthrough pretty much I've ever done, it's always been the case that you're, you're taking like the, the whatever characters did well for you in the main playthrough, or Titus, Waka, and Riku, you take those guys forward and you fight with them. Now, in my mind, it had been Titus, Kimari, and Waka for the most part. And I thought, well, okay, uh, Oren's kind of entered the mix as well, but those three I, I would have been happy to continue with, and in general, I'm sure it will work fine. But then I remembered that the Celestial Weapons are pretty unique in that they have interesting uh, abilities and function in a way that is different from normal equipment. Now this isn't going to be news to the majority of people watching, but I'm sure you would have noticed that when you use Celestial Weapons, they do damage contingent on how close you are to your maximum HP. So if you're at absolute maximum HP, they will do their absolute maximum damage output. But if you're near like critical HP, then you're going to be doing much less damage. Now, this is not true for every single character and every single one of their celestial weapons. And this is where sort of the thinking in advance can actually come into it. Now, we're used to kind of Titus, Waka and Riku. And those three have the same mechanics for their celestial weapons. When they're high HP, they do a lot of damage. 
when they're low HP, they do not so much damage. Now, for this particular challenge, as we've seen, healing can be a, a pretty big problem. And since X potions are very hard to come by, the odds of you being at, at maximum HP or near maximum HP for extended periods of time against very difficult enemies felt pretty unlikely to me. And so for that reason, Auron becomes a good option in this challenge because his Celestial Weapon works the opposite to Titus Waka and Riku and Kimari. His one basically does more damage the less HP he has because, of course, it's Auron and he's awesome. So that's why in this particular challenge, it's actually a good idea if you're facing like the hardest enemies you can face to use Auron instead because he's the guy where after the party's taken some hits and let's say they're all at below half HP, He's going to be out damaging Titus Waka, Riku, and Kimari. So that's why, like, thinking ahead, Auron is a good choice for this particular challenge. Now, thinking even further ahead, Yuna and Lulu could also potentially be useful in this challenge because they also don't have the same mechanic as some of the other characters. So their one, because they are mages, white mage and black mage, respectively for Yuna and Lulu, their celestial weapon damage is contingent on their MP level and not their HP level. And that means that once again, when they're low on HP, they could still do really high damage. So that was an important factor and one that, depending on how stuck you get and how important that specific mechanic becomes, you might actually be better off going with Auron, Yuna and Lulu for like the most difficult battles in this particular challenge. So that's another reason why I love these kind of challenges because they can really flip the script on what you're used to doing in these playthroughs. And depending on how ingrained your brain is to doing things a certain way, like with me, of course, having played the game countless times and having done the post game so many times, you don't even really consider, oh, let me level up Lulu and get her Celestial Weapon so that she can be a really good physical damage dealer for the post game. Like that just doesn't exist in a normal playthrough. But for this one, it could actually be a thing. Now, without getting too much kind of into it, and then you can also start to look at what the actual abilities of the weapons themselves are and see which ones are more useful. So the mages, of course, have uh, celestial weapon abilities that are more suited to using magic. But since we're going to be using physical attacks uh, for this playthrough, obviously as a result of the restrictions, then perhaps their weapon abilities, even though they have the nice mechanic where they can still do more damage when they have low HP, it might be offset by the fact that their weapon abilities aren't so great. So this is all kind of hindsight discussion and thinking, but at the time I, would, I just had a lot of momentum with the series and I was just like, let me just start getting the Celestial Weapons and if I get stuck, then I will start to sort of really think about this and see if I need to adjust anything because I did continue at this stage. What you're seeing in the background is I did try to do everything sort of legitimately for as long as I could, but especially once I started realizing that, oh man, like to get the Jupiter Sigil, I got to play all these extra Blitzball games and all this kind of stuff. I gave up on the whole, let me do everything in quote unquote real time kind of situation. So this was the final session in which I, I didn't use any kind of uh, editors or anything like that to get what I needed. Because after this one, I was just like, I need to make progress here and get to the end of this channel. So that's why um, what I will do at this stage is I'll probably skip ahead to when I do have all of the celestial weapons and I have the, the sigils and stuff that I need. But I will show you guys the, the Chocobo race because I've always said that for me at least, I find the, the Sun Sigil pretty comfortable and pretty easy to do. I've literally done it on my third attempt on a live stream. And it's always been one that's come relatively easy to me. I know some people literally give up on the game and just never end up getting it. But for me, for some reason, I've always been pretty good at it. I'm actually much worse at the Kimari Butterfly minigame. Like the Butterfly minigame often takes me longer than the um, than the Chocobo like Sigil zero second thing. But just as proof that I did do that one legitimately, I'll, I'll play back the, the moment in which I did that. But what I will be doing to save time here and to condense the, the series is to skip ahead to when I am more ready to um, get the Celestial Weapons and start using them and we'll go from there. Okay, so I spent about an hour and a half doing some of the, the stuff legitimately for the Celestial Weapons, but once I got to the Blitzball stuff for Waka, I was like, actually, wait, this is going to take too much time, and you can't really speed up Blitzball that much. So I was like, you know what, screw this, uh, I'm just going to edit it in. So I ended the session, I went on Final Fantasy X Editor, the trusty uh, editing program for Final Fantasy Saves, which is such a lifesaver. And um, yeah, I got all the stuff I needed, and so I had a powered up bunch of Celestial Weapons. 
Then I was like, I need to create some armors that are going to be specifically useful for, say, the Omega Ruins and for anything else moving forward. Now, the best way to do this is to, of course, speak to Wants in Makalania and to basically buy the four slot armors that he sells. Now, I picked up one or two things, I think, that had four slots just from the high level enemies that I fought but once is pretty essential. Now, I ran into an interesting issue. I am pretty sure that I must have spoken to once in Gagazette, because I always do, and he sells some useful stuff that could potentially be useful for, like, Seymour Flux or Unileska and that kind of thing. I'm pretty sure I even bought some stuff from him, but for some reason, it might be because I used a cutscene skipper. It could be related to that. Um, I don't exactly remember. It's been a while since I got to that stage, but once was not in Makalania, so I was like, um... Yeah, that's not right. So basically, once again, I had to kind of go back into Final Fantasy Editor to fix that. I got really confused. I saw this and I was like, there's just no way that that shouldn't be happening. And I even ran back to Gagazette. I thought there might be some kind of glitch because of the, the cutscene skipping mod that I used. And he might still be stuck in Gagazette or something like that. But I went back there and he wasn't there either. So once had completely like pulled the Durin and disappeared in this playthrough. Basically, this is what happens if you never speak to him in Gagazette, I believe. But I did, of course, speak to him, and I'm pretty sure I literally bought some stuff from him in this playthrough so far. So him not appearing in Markelania is just, is just a glitch. And so it's something that I had to kind of fix again using the editor so that I could gain access to the armors I would normally be able to buy through him. And so with that, it was time to head into my first post-game area, which would, of course, be the Omega Ruins. It's always my favorite place to go once the story is done. It's a pretty decent level for like end game characters where you haven't really started to get OP and started stat maxing. And so I thought this could be very, very interesting. Now, of course, the biggest threat in the Omega Ruins is going to be the Great Malbro and the fact that you always get ambushed when you fight it. So at this stage, I hadn't actually done like the Final Fantasy editor. I hadn't reloaded a new save. I thought to myself, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to try and see what I can do without basically like using once and his uh, special armors so this was a little bit foolish but i thought let me just like uh, make things a little bit more entertaining and see how i get through if i don't have uh, the once armors to to help me out so i tried to set up and see how things went so you're seeing uh, for example i don't have uh, aura in the front line i should have him in the front line but for now like stat wise he's a little bit lower i didn't want to spend time like uh, working on his stats and that kind of thing. So I thought, let me just focus on the the characters a little bit more ready to to kind of take the fight to the enemies in the Omega Ruins and Omega himself. So this was just some setup time before I got going. Once again, I did something probably a bit suicidal here, but Confused Proof was something I just simply didn't have anyway. And I decided to try and use armors like this to see if I could survive and Generally, this was just not a good idea, but I thought, let me just see how far I can get with this. And so I tried to set my party up to uh, get through the Omega Room. So, yeah, Kimari had this uh, Lucid Armlet with Confused Ward, Poison Ward, Stone Proof. And I was looking for, like, one final thing to add for it that could potentially be useful. For me, at least, it was a, a lot of this was a case of trying my best to not waste items that either would be impossible or very difficult to regain in this particular challenge. So for this, I ended up literally going for like Dark Ward uh, to see if I could basically, even if he was uh, like Berserked or something, at least if he didn't have Darkness, he'd be able to, to take out uh, the Malbro a bit more effectively. So I used Dark Ward. Again, this is far from like the, I would say, advised way to, to do this stuff. But at this stage, I was kind of curious to see how I could sort of rumble through um, the Omega Ruins with this kind of non-optimized setup and well you, you'll see what happens as a result of this uh, kind of not not the best preparation I've ever seen but Titus did have the four empty slots so I thought I can make him a much more definitive armor and so also Phoenix and Stone Proof already puts him in a very strong position I would have loved to have had Confused Proof here that would have made a huge difference but like I say that's one of the things that's been the most difficult to come by uh, in this particular challenge so I had to take some time to think. Now, I did want the auto med as well. I think the more stuff that you can automate, of course, in a challenge like this, the better. And so auto phoenix plus auto med felt like a very nice combination to me. And I did have a lot of gill from all of the stuff that I sold at this point. So Titus was going to be, well, he was going to be in the front line pretty much regardless. So you know, 
I decided to just uh, give him the best thing that I could, especially since he was the only one that already had this nice armor to, to start with. So Auto Med was added, and now it was a question of like, what is the final thing to equip? I mean, in an ideal world, I think for me it would have been, it would have been, I think, confused proof. For now, I decided to leave Titus at that, and I thought I'll make my mind up a bit later after I've had an actual run at um, at the Omega Ruins, and we'll see what happens from there. So you can generally see that I was struggling a bit to decide how to equip things, and especially since I didn't have wants to give me the, the armors that I needed, I was starting to think like, you know, what is the, the best way to deal with this? And this is where I was like, you know what, I did manage to get four free slots for Titus just by uh, fighting in like the inside sin area and stuff. So I decided to just head back to um, the Calm Lands and just fight the Adamantoids a few times just to see what happens. Uh, what kind of damage we're doing and how like quickly we could potentially get a good armor from this guy instead of simply just hacking it in. And so interestingly enough, within about, I think, maybe seven battles, something like that, it really didn't take long at all, uh, Waka already got a Tetra Arm Guard. So this is like, a, again, if you want to do it kind of super legit, and for whatever reason you don't have Gil, or you don't want to use once, or you can't use once, or whatever it might be, this is generally a decent way to try to get these kind of armors. And so once Waka got it too, I thought, okay, let's uh, let's customize here. So... Yeah, normally this wouldn't be necessary, but because of this like once glitch and I didn't want to sort of quit recording, uh, pull the save out, go into Final Fantasy Editor, change stuff, put it back in, I thought, you know what, maybe it's, it's almost just as quick and I can, I can gain some levels in the process too. So I just decided to go for that. And to be honest, you can see, I mean, it worked out pretty, pretty well. So, this one, anytime I had a four free slot, I was like, okay, Auto Fiend is definitely going on there. And Stoneproof, again, is one of these that's pretty much a must. There's not, since you can't heal when someone gets petrified, Stoneproof has to be on there, otherwise you're gonna be in huge trouble. So two more free slots here. Auto Med seems like a, a good option, again, because there's a lot of statuses to deal with in Omega Ruins. But I went for SOS Regen with Waka um, this time around, just to, just to see how that was gonna work. But for Titus, I think I, I left his, um, his full slot open just to see how it was gonna work. And yes, the Sonic Lance for Kimari. I decided Kimari having a Celestial Weapon wasn't that important here because like first strike, um, especially against the, the Great Malboro, was going to be sufficiently important. And so at least for like most of the Omega Ruins, it felt to me like having that sort of early preemptive strike plus speed was going to be more important than having the Celestial Weapon um, stuff. So that's why I made sure I gave uh, Waka and Kimari some first strike abilities. So evading counter plus first strike already makes life a lot easier. Okay, it is time to head into the first, what I pretty much call post-game area of the game. So <laughs> I had to search for it. I, I always forget exactly where it is. It's in one of these like little cloudy island bits off the, the main map, but it had been a while since I found it manually. Okay, let's get out there and get into some encounters and see how the team did. Now, <laughs> literally the first encounter of the Omega Ruins put my setup to the test. This is the test. I mean, if you can get through this, then I would say the odds of you surviving the Omega Ruins and getting to Omega himself is very high. Now, this was already a bad setup here. This was not good. I kept things deliberately on times one speed to give myself some time to commentate on this. Um, depending on what happened. Now, evade encounter kind of stuff counts against you here because, well, the Great Malboro can't like knock you out of the confusion because you're just going to evade it. So this is not good. This one, unfortunately, looks a physical attack, but isn't, as we know. And let's see the, the Waka sort of um, SOS regen, how much that helps. Now, Kimari's Dark Ward meant that he doesn't have darkness, which might be enough for me to take out the Great Malbro, but it doesn't look like it because we simply don't have the HP. So the poison is just too strong here, and Kimari's not really going to be able to, to make it here. It's just not enough, as you can see. But Waka's darkness wore off, and he just about managed to get the hit in. So this was not pretty, and I did get a little bit lucky, and I thought to myself, wow, like already with the first encounter, I almost got the game over. So this wasn't looking too great. Uh, you can see if you don't have Berserk protection, and you don't have um, confusion protection, 
things are going to get very nasty. But of course, for things like the Zorus, it's an insta win because you've got the initiative first strike as well. And Kimari, more often than not, is not going to miss. So you're going to see some more of like the other encounters here. And in general, most stuff doesn't really cause a problem here. It's just uh, the Great Malboro is such a different beast because of that automatic ambush and bad breath that it's it makes things way more difficult. So these guys, like I say, two hits, three hits, most of the time they get taken out. Uh, my party at this stage with their stats, they're relatively quick as well. So we can get a decent number of turns in um, before the enemies can. And so an encounter like this is, is not a problem at all. One of the only other encounters on my mind was um, was the one with the spirit because it can do that sort of uh, poison mist attack that can give you confusion. And confusion protection was kind of my Achilles heel um, here. So yeah, another enemy that can confuse. And I didn't know if I'd be able to hit it, but I did. And so there you go. These guys also no problem. I kept Titus with, with his Kalad Bolt because I was like at least having one guy that has that special sort of ignore defense ability on the Celestial. Uh, I think would be pretty nice and so for this particular battle is irrelevant because this guy has the armored status that the um, the celestial weapon doesn't help with for that one you need the piercing ability as we've spoken about already but there was going to be plenty of encounters where Titus would uh, would be able to out damage the other party members because he has the special celestial ability but yeah I was starting to feel a lot more confident get into the flow things were looking good Again, my only main fear was just what's going to happen in the next Malboro encounter. Like every time that comes, it's just like a Russian roulette. You just don't know what you're going to get and whether you're going to be able to pull through. Like the last one, uh, the first encounter we had with it, is very, very close. But it shouldn't appear like that frequently, I think. I was a bit unlucky to get it to appear as like the first encounter upon entering the ruins. But I was just making a beeline for um, Ultima. I went to, to get through as quickly as I could because the more time obviously you spend dallying around here the more time you are going to be dealing with um, you know great Melbourne encounters that it's going to be a big problem yeah the fact that we can even take big haymakers now it's definitely definitely nice party's looking pretty strong as I pass those chests there uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it before because there's so many people viewing this series I think there's a lot of you that haven't viewed a lot of stuff on the channel before. This might be the only thing that you're watching on the channel. So while we're here, uh, check out like my live streams in the past. Uh, for two years in a row, I did do um, a really fun challenge with the community uh, to do with the Omega Ruins chests, which I think you'll really enjoy watching um, as a VOD. So I would, I would check that out. Now, this guy, again, he attacks one character at a time. And so in my mind, I was like, this guy's not a threat. Um, he's going to use up some Phoenix Downs, but nothing that should worry me and you can kind of see the difference between the damage that Kimari took and Titus took is kind of funny and so Kimari taking less damage than those two and being able to actually take the hit was, uh, was definitely beneficial you can see him very quickly start to gather uh, spear levels as well and this was a nice drop I have to say like we could definitely put this to use in a specific battle that was really nice and so yeah, Kimari, you can see he's kind of slacking a little bit, but he's already got 19 sphere levels. So when the time comes, I can definitely make use of that. But yeah, it was really nice that he could just about survive this. <laughs> it was really cool. But yeah, these two. So it's about 6,000, I think it's like 13,000 or something, and 19,000. So you can see the difference in the amount of kills each character has got here. But Kimari gets another one, and that probably means that he'll die next time if he doesn't upgrade his HP. And he got a soul armlet too, so getting some nice drops here. This is one reason you want to hang around here. You can pick up some nice stuff that normally would be a real pain in the ass to try to customize uh, in this challenge. Or in any playthrough, for that matter. Now Yuna, with her 600 HP, that was, sorry, MP, that was also nice. It allows me to keep healing here as well. And so... Without like too much delay, I was able to make it to Ultimate Weapon. So I was looking forward to this one. In my mind, I was like, I can probably crush this guy. It shouldn't be too bad. The only problem was that I knew Ultima had a confusion attack. And I thought that could potentially, like depending on who it hits and how it manifests, it could be a serious problem. But in general, I wasn't too worried about Ultima. Omega's a whole different beast, and we'll talk about Omega soon. But uh, for now, it was uh, Ultima. 
I was kind of upset that you couldn't steal from Ultima. I'm so used to, like, stealing those Daughter Tomorrows from Ultima. No can do. So, Alter Battle does work for this particular boss, which is nice. And that meant that more than likely it will also work for Omega Weapon 2. But there you go, 21,000 from Titus. That's why he's got the Celestial. He can really do some nice damage here. And so Ultima uh, is not going to last very long because he has 70,000 HP, which is not that much. But Omega is going to be much, much, much harder to beat. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, this was a this was a complete wipeout here. Didn't get to do anything. But trust me when I say uh, Omega is very Omega built different. We'll see. Let's head out to the outdoor area now. Here you have those uh, mandatory encounters before you get to Omega, and well, they're pretty much randomized, but they have a different kind of pool of encounters that it could be. So you won't encounter like a Zorus here. But it's like the strongest, let's say, six enemies in the Omega Ruins. You're going to encounter one of those guys. And so first battle was against Varuna, who has some decent defense and some decently powerful magic. But again, the team is just too fast. And so unless you've got like, I don't know, some supreme defenses or you've got like 200,000 HP or something, you're not really going to be able to stand up to this team. So yeah, Varuna was an easy one to take out, but... Round two against the Great Malbro. So here we go again. We barely made it through last time. And this time, Waka is the one confused, but he managed to hit Kimari, which basically meant that it was game over. So this is what I mean. Like, the fact that Kimari couldn't dodge that because he doesn't have Evading Counter on his weapon ruined everything. And so we're dead here. This is, I already knew at this stage I was dead. Titus landed a hit, but... This is where it all went wrong. So there you go. My first game over in the Omega Ruins. And it's no surprise that it was the Great Malbro that delivered the killing blow to the party. Now, you get an autosave here, which was really, really nice. I got very lucky that it gave me an autosave there. So it saved me maybe like seven minutes or something. But still, it's, uh, it was definitely useful. Now, again, I was already thinking, like, what can I do here to increase my chances of staying alive? It was It was tough. Because I made it this far, I thought I can probably get away with it. I could probably just make one or two more tweaks here, like adding poison proof to Titus's uh, to Titus's weapon, and see if I can just make it through. I probably wouldn't have to encounter more than say a couple of Great Malbros on the way down to Omega. So I thought this is uh, we should still be able to manage here. Might still get another game over or two, but I think I prefer that to trying to grind out like a specific armor to survive uh, against it. Out of instinct, I still just want to come down here and get this chest anyway. I don't think it was essential, but it's like, it's something I do every time, so kind of felt like I had to do it. And this time we got a much more um, favorable encounter. I mean, you can basically get to the bottom without encountering any Great Malbro, so you could try to rely on that RNG as well. And I thought that's also a possibility. So that's why I decided to kind of stick it out instead of trying to... Um, like really make a, a bulletproof setup for just like that particular battle. And well, again, at this stage, I wasn't even sure I could beat Omega Weapon because Omega Weapon is so much more powerful than Ultima. I thought it's not, um, it's, it's far from guaranteed and it might not even be possible at this stage. So um, again, I, I always mention it, but it's worth kind of repeating because I think at this stage, again, most people that are watching would have played the HD remaster by now. But in case uh, you haven't or you don't know too much about it, Omega Weapon originally only had 99,999 HP and that made it much much easier like especially for this area there's basically random encounters that have almost as much HP as that guy and it's only a 30,000 HP increase from Ultima so it was always very underpowered in my opinion then in the international slash PAL edition of the PS2 version of, um, of Final Fantasy X back in the day they modified Omega Weapon. So Omega Weapon went from having 99,000 HP to 999,000 HP, which put him in a totally different league in terms of, like, you know, how powerful it was compared to what we were facing. So, remember, Brassel's Fine Leon had 60,000 Form 1, 120,000 in Form 2, so 180,000 total. This guy had more than five times the HP of Brassel's Fine Leon. So, this party was effectively at the kind of stats that we beat Brassel's Fine Leon with, and so giving it five times more HP and making it 
as powerful, if not a bit more powerful than Brass's Fine Leon, meant that it could be a very tough challenge that I might not be able to beat with uh, with this particular sort of setup slash level. So that's why Omega Weapon is much more of an interesting challenge. And I would say it's like it's like a baby Dark Aeon. It's even like compared to say Dark Vanifor, it's a lot less powerful. But it's like a first taste of a truly beefy uh, enemy that you can face in this game that isn't like a monster arena creation or something like that. So, yeah. So soft Arm Guard was nice, and this is one of the ways where um, even if you can't farm any more Petrify Grenades, you can try to farm the Demonoliths to, to get those Stoneproof Armors if you need them for a particular battle. So, yeah, taking out the Demonoliths was also good because they could have posed a, a bit of a problem with their stage effects, but... At least uh, with auto med and with stone proof, they're they're pretty much rendered uh, useless. So that was fine. Okay, demonoliths again. This is fine. And for me, I like encountering these guys because every time it just means you've got more chance of getting a stone proof armor. It's one of those ones that is difficult to come by in this challenge, and you basically can't you can't steal petrified grenades, and nothing really drops them either. So. You're kind of a bit more forced to rely on Stoneproof as an equipment drop instead of farming the customization item for it. So this one did take a little while, but once again, it was pretty much a formality that I win anyway. So we got the job done. And Kimari gaining a nice bunch of um, experience there. So we got another Stoneproof for Waka. Let's see this one. Ah, okay, that was a Stone Ward. Sorry. I always assume they only give Stoneproofs, but yeah, there is a chance they give Stone Ward as well, unfortunately. Okay, so it was time for the final one, and of course, it was the Great Malbro. I mean, it just had to be, didn't it? So the final thing standing in my way was this guy, and we got double confused. So at this point, I was like, okay, I'm dead. I'm screwed. Because if Titus or Kim, if Titus or Walker hit each other, they're going to end up killing each other, and they can evade the normal attack anyway from Malbro. So I thought, this is... I'm finished. And I was getting ready to go for another run at this particular part. Thankfully the auto save was there, so it wasn't it wasn't the end of the world, but I was a little bit annoyed. Then this happened, which I completely forgot about. I was like, oh shit, this is gonna get rid of the confusion and we can still win, and we did. So <laughs> that was, again, very lucky that that particular move happened, but it meant that I could defeat uh, the Great Malbro, and I was uh, it was the right decision to kind of not try to go back and prepare specifically for the Great Malbro, because we got it done, and it was finally time to face Omega and see how he'd fare. There's no saves just outside. And if I was on the PS2 version, it would have been a lot better for me. Because I could have just put a save state in here. And I could retry the battle a lot more easily. With this, every time you fail against Omega, you have to, even with the auto save, you have to fight all of these guys again. So first of all, it was just uh, making use of those extra sphere levels that we got to help Kimari get even closer to Tidus and Waka. I had the sphere levels in my pocket for those guys and they were they were to be used on like an as needed basis. More than likely Omega was going to be a, an as needed basis but uh, I didn't want to do anything preemptively before I actually saw what I was dealing with and the kind of damage I'd be taking and being able to, to dish out. So there you go, strength up to 83 and almost up to 7000 HP which is pretty solid. At this point I decided to actually run back so like I say this was just a way for me to make repeat attempts easier against Omega. I wasn't. I ran a quick test here just to see how it works, and as you'll see very soon, you just have you just re-encounter the enemies here. So the run to Omega until I believe you actually defeat Omega. I'm not even sure about that one either. But uh, the run to Omega, they will keep respawning these enemies in this particular part, and so basically I ran back in order to get the auto save in. That's why I teleported down to the previous area and then came back up. So I thought at least let me sort of cash in the levels that I have and if I lose against Omega I'll be able to come back from this particular part. So yeah, that was the kind of way I decided to do it because I don't have uh, save states and this was the kind of closest thing I had to a save state um, for this particular run. Now, of course, on the way down I encountered another one. Now, I'd been fairly lucky at this point. I'd won twice and lost once. Uh, let's see what happened this time. See if we can maintain a winning record against the Great Malro in um, in the Omega Ruins. This time it was again it wasn't looking good, but Tidus with that Celestial Weapon is doing so much damage that I managed to pull through, and we were three-one against the Great Malro. So I was starting to feel a bit more confident that even with this sort of 
suboptimal equipment setup for Great Malbro, I was still able to, to get the win most of the time. And so within another couple of minutes, I managed to make it down to Omega once again. So I think with times four speed and depending on which encounters you get, it literally takes maybe like two or three minutes to, to come back down. So it's not the, the worst um, kind of repeat thing in the world. So now I had to set up for Omega. Like I didn't really want to have my, um, like my first strike initiative, all that kind of stuff. I had to set up a little bit better for this one. So I had a look at my equipment once again after healing. I switched Kimari to his Celestial Weapon, but for Waka, I just went to see, like, I, went, I thought having, like, one person with the First Strike and the Piercing might also be better in case he has the tough armor and Waka can actually end up doing more damage, potentially. So I decided to leave Waka with his rematch, but Tidus and Kimari had their Celestial Weapons, and I thought, let's just give this thing a go and see how we do. But as I say, 1 million HP in the HD remaster and PAL slash International PS2 version, so he's a whole different beast in those ones and he could very much kick our ass so let's see how we do this, this is the first major major challenge of this entire run i would say so yeah you can see 27,000, 17,000 from kimari is nice yeah so even though he has a million hp i think we're working through at a decent enough pace If you take the time to like level up for another few hours, obviously you'll just be able to beat this guy in like, you know, 11 hits or whatever. But again, we've been taking things as they come, and I think these make for much more interesting battles. So that's what we've been doing here. This one, we were fortunate that we got a miss here. And so far, at least, it was looking pretty good. I, I like this start that we had from the boys. Now, Kimari really did well to survive the, the first attack. Let's see how much this one does. This was another crucial one. And again, well survived. And we do have the Phoenix Downs. But now you're going to start to see the Celestial Weapons kind of show their weakness. Uh, especially for characters like Tidus. So you can see down to 11,000. So it's still more than Waka's because he can break the damage limit. But already it's, uh, it's a big difference. But it was looking like we were kind of in the ballpark. It, we weren't like a million miles away from, from being able to win here. But the damage output really started to slow down now, of course. This I was also very much worried about. <laughs> Their magic defense is definitely not very good. And... Yeah. So, magic defense being that low. And, <laughs> you know... The, the HP that they have definitely wasn't enough. So you get to see, this is what I mean by the first real legitimate boss. Like when I faced um, Brass's final Leon, you could tell I wasn't like that far away from being able to win. Uh, but this guy is pretty OP compared to me. It's one of the first times that's happened. So at this stage, I was thinking, what is the best way to try and tackle? Do we just simply flow, get stronger? Um, or is it some combination of things that I can do to give myself a better chance? Now, do remember that Kimari has the special alchemy weapon. And obviously, as you saw in that battle, because of the Celestial Weapon situation, being revived with only half of your HP was making quite a big difference to my damage output. And so, because alchemy is so rare in this particular run, it did feel like Kimari was kind of a potentially essential team member here. Because he, if he does have Auto Phoenix for a particular battle, he can revive people at their full HP, which would make a big difference. So I did cash in a little bit, and then I was looking to see where I want to move next on the grid. Because obviously I do want some magic defense as well. So I couldn't quite make my mind up at the time, but I did realize that I needed to kind of go back and uh, and prepare a little bit better before getting another attempt at Omega. Now looking back, again, this was a time where probably Yuna would be a better choice, because she has very good magic defense, and she has a celestial weapon that will continue to do good damage even when she's at low HP. So again, like watching back in hindsight, probably a good idea to use Yuna in this battle. So I did make a start at leveling up Tidus a little bit, but once I got to the end of this particular grid, I wasn't too sure where to go next, and I thought, you know what, it might be a good idea to uh, capture what I need to capture in the Omega Ruins, because again, I can gain uh, sphere levels in, uh, in like a natural way, and I'd be able to unlock some more stuff in the Monster Arena. So I decided to uh, do the capturing in the Omega Ruins now, and so I headed back to the first save sphere, 
in the area and begin some monster capturing. And so again, it's going to be pretty brief highlights from the monster capturing. You've seen me fight basically everything here. And so as long as you've got like these, um, these first strike weapons and stuff, you should be fine. Now, the problem here is that because I don't have the Celestial Weapon for Tidus, for example, we will be doing way less damage against, say, the Great Malboro. And that's why hanging out near the safe, safe sphere and saving regularly is a good idea. Because now, like, my chances of, let's say, the odds of beating the Great Malboro are about 70%. With Tidus not having the Celestial Weapon, I think it drops to like 30%, 40%. And so there was a, a decent chance. So you have to kind of save regularly and stick near the save sphere for at least uh, most of what you can encounter in this particular part of the ruins. If you're missing, let's say, a few of the higher level ones, it, it is a good idea to go to the upper portion because they appear more exclusively there. But for now, for catch, capturing like most of the smaller stuff like these guys, Obviously, you need to be sticking uh, to this particular part. Now, I still hadn't encountered any black elements, and I hadn't encountered any helmers, and I hadn't encountered any spirits. And so finally, I got this. This was the encounter I was a bit worried about, actually, because I don't have anything that can take these guys out unless I have my celestial weapon. So this was a, a very dangerous encounter for me because we've got confusion, as you can see. You've got Berserk, which again makes you lose control of your party members. This was extremely close. I was at times four and I was kind of just like, just watching intently at what was happening there. But you guys saw, I mean, very tough defenses from the black elements. And I can't take uh, the spirit out in one hit. So the odds of poison mist being used as retaliation is pretty high, which gives us confusion. And then the black elements can also use Berserk. So in general, it's a very dangerous encounter. Uh, almost as dangerous as, I'd say, the, the Great Malboro. So it's another one we had to generally be careful of. So plenty of saves here and just sticking near the, the save sphere. Here is the Great Malboro again. I think it was 3-1 at the moment against the Great Malboro. So let's see what happens this time. Don't have the nice Tidus damage to get us out of trouble, but we still managed it 4-1. So I think we're still doing very well against the Great Malboro. So it had been maybe like 20, 25 encounters, and I, I just could not get the Master Tombow and stuff to appear. And also the, the Halmers just weren't appearing too. So the Omega Ruins can definitely be a bit annoying, but a mix of kind of just leaving the area, coming back, um, heading up to the top part if you're specifically looking for things like the Varuna, um, that can definitely help you out. So... Uh, the Great Malbro was appearing in plenty. I mean, it was really on a mission to try and kill us, but the battles end up playing out quite similarly. So you're seeing like two characters get confused. Then it does the normal attack on Tidus. The confusion uh, gets taken off, and then we end up winning the battle. It's getting pretty kind of formulaic in that sense. So that was the uh, win number eight, and it only took us out the second time we encountered it. So save once again, and I do want to show you the next encounter that I had with the black elements. I did want to at least encounter them three times so that I could capture six black elements. So let's see what happens this time. Th this encounter genuinely did worry me. Um, thankfully, they work, once again, they work left to right here, so like to their right. Because if they kept trying to attack this guy, then it would have been a bit more of a problem. But thankfully, no poison mist this time either. I believe there's a 50% chance he uses poison mist, so... That definitely made life a lot easier. So this encounter we dealt with uh, just fine as well. And so finally, after literally like 40 encounters, I managed to get the Halmer encounter. It took bloody ages. Got the poison mist, but it wasn't enough to change the outcome. And we finally captured one of everything in the Omega Ruins. And so it was time to head back to the Monster Arena. And so with that, we had captured at least one of every single fiend in Spira. And we end up getting Designer Wallet, which is completely useless for, for this challenge and for a lot of challenges. But yeah, at least we end up uh, getting that there too, because it's a chance for us to farm some equipment if we need it. And we've got the Ultimate Eyeball, Stamina Tablet times 60. Um, yeah, could potentially be useful to us, because of course it allows us to, um, to customize some useful stuff. Star Curtain 99, Auto Reflect could have its niche as well. At least now, once I hopefully did defeat Omega and I was ready to take on the Monster Arena, I'd have basically everything unlocked in terms of bosses. So I was checking out here, two of those, three of those. So I did need to make sure I got at least five of everything uh, to unlock Ultima Buster. 
And so I did basically have to get back out to the Omega Ruins and just capture a few more uh, Master Tomberry slash Varunas. And also you saw Ironclad was missing too, because you need 10 of each Iron Giant type, so I had to go back. So I'm not going to show you guys anything more from the random encounters there, because you, you've seen more than enough at this stage. Uh, on the way back, I kind of cheekily went back to Luca to see if like those uh, mechs could somehow still be there. It seemed very unlikely, but I was thinking ahead and thinking, man, like I really need X potions there. Like they could really make a difference in like the the hardest battles to come. And I thought if there was a way to farm X potions other than literally playing like Blitzball leagues, then it would be great because yeah, I mean if you need to use like 20 X potions in a battle. Playing 20 Blitzball leagues, or even 10, if you can get two, uh, two top scorers from the team, is just it's just very unlikely and like basically something that you'd never redo. Really so I was looking for it, but of course that didn't happen. Um, and so X potions really are one of the hardest things to come by in this particular challenge. So with all the work I did in the Omega Ruins, I did end up getting a uh, four free slot armor for Kimari. And again, anytime you have the four free slots, you kind of have to be working with Auto Phoenix. Because he has the Alchemy too, it's an absolute must and a very powerful combination for this particular run. Thinking ahead, I mean, if you're fighting like the absolute most difficult enemies, breaking HP limit probably was going to be necessary. Um, I did want to do it like now. But thinking ahead, I thought maybe that could make it a, a difference to proceedings. So, getting wins to discovery is also another tough one, and getting break HP limit armors is tough. Now, it's annoying because Omega Weapon can give you break HP limit armor, but only three slots, which I think is really annoying. It should give you four, really, but it doesn't, so. Now, I did decide to go for the auto regen because I did know that if you can beat Kotos, which I was pretty sure eventually, if I can beat Omega Weapon, I can beat Kotos because, well, Kotos only hits one character at a time. And if you can beat Kotos, you get 40 healing springs if you overkill him and 20 if you don't. And so auto regen is actually a weapon ability that you can pretty much customize at will uh, at this like late game, end game stage. And so that's why I decided to give him the auto regen, thinking it would be a really beneficial thing to have at this particular stage for this armor. So I was really starting to invest in Kimari at this stage because of the alchemy as well. So, Auto Phoenix and Auto Regen. And so I spoke to the trainer, and now that I had five of every single Fiend in Spira, we managed to unlock Ultima Buster and get ourselves 99 Dark Matters. So that was huge, because for the first time, I could now have Ribbon. So, capturing five of everything for that reason is always huge, because getting 99 uh, Dark Matters is definitely not going to be easy in any run. So, yeah, this was how the stats were looking at this stage. So just as another recap of where I was at at the moment, nothing over 100, but these stats were, were pretty good at this stage. And other than the Ultima from Omega Weapon, I was holding up pretty well. But that magic defense, as you can see, is absolutely nowhere. The magic defense is pants. So that's the, the, the biggest problem that I'm facing at the moment. So you can see Kimari shot back up to 59 um, in terms of his spear level because we did all of that capturing together. And so, yeah, time to cash in some sphere levels once again. And so once again, as I always have been, I continued my sort of incremental increases of stats. It wasn't like, okay, let's just cash in like 60 at once and get to a completely different level of stats. And before long, I was like, I think this is enough for now. Let's just take on a few of the Monster Arena enemies and see where we're at, because I was a bit curious. And well, like I say, Omega, I think is pretty well matched for a lot of what's in the Monster Arena. And he is weaker than a lot of what's in the Monster Arena. But there are some enemies, I think, that are probably still easier than Omega. So I thought, let me just start trying out the Area Conquest and see how I do um, with this particular party before I go back and give Omega another go. So again, just some like little extra touches here, like nothing too crazy. But I did feel like I needed to take one more step up before I start fighting the next batch of bosses in this run. This was a particularly nice and chunky area for, for stats, um, so I definitely wanted to, to get those. So there you go, he's a closer match to Titus now. His agility is nowhere near, but in terms of uh, strength and stuff, he's definitely much closer. So with this, I was like, let's just take on some Monster Arena stuff. It's been, um, 
It's been a while since we've been able to defeat a boss. It's been hours at this stage. His Ultima doesn't even really count. So let's start from the top and go for Strato Avis. I mean, I anticipated a win here. It does have an attack that hits everybody, but I was pretty sure I'd be able to take it down. So I will share like uh, the HP and stuff for all of these enemies as I forget them, uh, especially for like area conquest and stuff. I don't remember them too well, but it was something like 380,000 or 280,000 or something like that. And so, based on the damage we were doing with our Celestial weapons, it was looking pretty good. Now, Waka didn't have his Celestial, and it seems like he probably should at this stage. Like, having two guys with no Celestial and only one that does, it seemed like the damage output is too slow here. It doesn't seem that necessary. And already, the bird has been grounded, so it was only a matter of time before it got taken out. So this was pretty easy work. Evade Encounter doing his job. Once you start getting to a stage where Evade Encounter won't help you, then things are going to get very serious because you just have to flat out like take the hit. So, um, for this stuff at least, we can we can deal with it. But you can see if all three of them had their celestial weapons, that this guy would have been long dead at this stage. But it basically died without landing a hit, and it took a critical to rub salt in the wound as well. So even like the lower level monster arena stuff was looking like it was very much within reach. And so I was like, okay, why don't we just continue? So I replaced um, Waka's weapon with um, with his world champion. And, and same with Kimari. Again, if it comes to a situation where I really need his alchemy or something, I would have gone for it. But at the moment, I felt like I could brute force a lot of stuff. So let's continue rolling and see how far we get. Malboro Menace, I think, is going to be too hard. Um, since it was in order, I just thought, let's just go for this one next. But Putrid Breath, obviously even worse than Bad Breath. And so, yeah. I think until you start having confused proofs or ribbons or that kind of thing, in this challenge, Malboro Menace is going to be a very big problem. Because there is no, let's see how lucky we get and maybe we don't get confused and stuff like that. It's just, this guy's a complete like mismatch for my particular team. So We got a little bit cocky here, because we beat Strato Avis so easily and I'd been defeating um, like the great Malboro. I thought, yeah, like maybe we can still win, but... No, so there's still a long way to go in this challenge. Like some battles make it look like, oh, at this stage I'm I'm ready, I'm OP, it's fine, and then you realise that there's there's certain battles that are such a mismatch for you that you still have a long way to go. So that was a nice little kind of humbling uh, lesson from uh, the Malboro Menace. But there's definitely things I knew I could defeat. Like that one, I was pretty sure like I probably wouldn't be able to win anyway. But I did want to fight Kotos, because Kotos was like a, a source of auto-regen. So if I can beat Kotos pretty easily, then it means I'll be able to get auto-regen whenever I want, basically. Which would be pretty important for this challenge, because of course, healing is one of the, the biggest struggles, fundamentally. When you're attack only, slash auto-battle. But as you can see, I mean, Kotos hits like a train. But auto-phoenix, greater than sign, Kotos, basically. I mean... If he only has a, a singular attack, then not a problem. So it's only a matter of time before we end up doing enough damage. And all you really need to do is just replenish your um, your stocks of Phoenix Downs once you fight him. Like, you can defeat this guy without the Celestial Weapons as well. It's not really that big a deal. Uh, it definitely is one of these where, like, the first time you fight him, let's say you're just doing monster capturing for the first time, and you fight Kotos as like a test one for free, and he just completely like smashes you out. You think to yourself, "Oh my god, like this guy's absolutely monstrous." Um, but then, like if you have Auto Phoenix, then you start to realize that he's he's not a threat at all. The fact that Kimari can even miss him that upsets me. Like certain enemies feel like they should be unmissable, and Kotos is one of those guys. But 440,000 HP. This one I remember well because um, Kotos is a very important figure in the No Sphere Grid Dark Aeon challenge. <laughs> so any like No Sphere Grid Dark Aeon player will know how much HP Kotos has because he's an important source of farming for spheres for your Aeons. But that's a whole different discussion. If you're curious about No Sphere Grid Dark Aeons, definitely uh, check that out on the channel. It's like the oldest, kind of uh, shittiest quality challenge, but it's also the most significant on the channel. And Kotos is an important figure in that.
Yeah, you can see, because the boys aren't like completely OP, it is dragging on a little bit, and 440,000 will take a while. And again, thinking ahead to Omega, who has more than double the HP that Kotos has, it's going to take a while, and we're going to take a lot of hits. And so we had to make sure we're ready for that. But eventually, again, with a nice critical to finish, Tynus gets the job done, and we should be getting, because we got the overkill, fortunately enough, we got 40, um, we got 40 healing springs, so that was really nice. And so I thought, yeah, why not? Let's keep rolling here. Replenish those Phoenix Downs, because I was down to 11, so that was well remembered. But in general, I was looking good, so it's time to, to keep moving. He doesn't sell remedies. I think he should sell remedies. If Rin can sell them, this guy should sell them. But anyway, let's get back into it and take on the next one, Curl Regina again. I was pretty confident I'd be able to, to take Curl Regina down. Decent HP once again, I think like... 380,000 or 480,000, something like that. We do have confusion problems, and so it is going to be a bit of a luck game to see who hits who and when it happens, and is Auto Phoenix going to kick in and stuff like that. But for now, at least, it was looking okay. I'm not sure if they use uh, Chaos on the third character if two of them are already confused. They probably do. I just got a little bit lucky here. But. In general, it's not too bad. But look at Waka's uh, damage output here. Really bad. And so this was definitely making me realize like how valuable Auron could be in this team. Especially once you face these like, longer battles. He's only doing 6,000 damage. The SOS regen is helping. It's, it's, it's allowing him to sort of get stronger again. But surviving for any length of time... Um, like enough that the regen will bring you back up to like a nice healthy number is kind of unlikely in these higher level battles so yeah we did get it done but you can tell it's definitely not optimal uh, Auron being out here would definitely be the better option I mean we're not using Waka's like attack reels or anything like that so it's kind of a bit like, other than Auron having low stats and needing some time to catch up there's no reason to not have Auron here basically but yeah that's another one on the board and this is another problem one. And, well, that's one reason. And here's reason number two. Oh, it didn't do it. But the coal there does a nice damage, I have to say, as well. Yeah, that's the reason why. So, if you can take it out before the space-time warp happens, then, of course, it's fine. But, yeah... This one was kind of, I felt like I had a shot because it, it doesn't have like an enormous amount of HP. But I wasn't sure if I could get it done with the with the current setup. So I just gave him anything he had that had Stoneproof on it for now. Even if the rest of it wasn't that ideal. And I fought it again to see if I could change the outcome. I mean, I, mean, I did get ambushed last time as well, which was a bit unlucky. But yeah, he hit me with the Space Time Vorpal again. So it's a little bit of a luck game. It's like, can you do enough damage before that hits? And the answer was looking like no, to be honest. Uh, if you can't survive space-time Vorpal, then it's unlikely that you'll be strong enough to defeat this guy. Unless, of course, like I say, you're already hitting for like 50,000 every single time or more, then you should be fine. But let's see what happens again. You see? It is programmed to use it pretty frequently, so... The odds of you doing all of the damage before it ever gets used does seem low. But I always hate this enemy so much and I hate that attack so much that I kind of... I want to keep grinding. And thankfully, my perseverance paid off because we did have that battle where it had multiple attacks where it didn't use Space Time Vorpal. And as I assumed, that was enough for me to get the job done and defeat this guy as well. So this one was definitely lucky. I got some good RNG here for it to not use Space Time for so long. But that's what was necessary at this particular moment in time. And we got the job done. So we defeated that guy as well. But Malbro Menace, of course, like the whole using Putrid Breath thing, like that's such a um, like definitive thing that it uses that you're not going to get away with kind of hoping that it doesn't use it, obviously. So up until now, Malbro Menace was the only thing that I knew I couldn't defeat. Cactar King, again, only hits one character at once. But this one, I was worried if I can even hit it at all. So let's just see how this one goes. Titus did land the first hit, but we missed the second. And well, it was going to be a guaranteed KO every single time it attacked. And well, it is quick and it counterattacks. So 
provided we could hit it enough, it was almost guaranteed that we'd win because we did have a lot of Phoenix Downs and we just grind it down until we won. But if it was like a you hit it once every 10 turns, then I think we wouldn't be able to win. So let's take a look here and see what happens. Thankfully, it doesn't have an enormous amount of HP, which again is very useful. Otherwise, again, it would have been impossible, I think. You'd have to hit it a lot more consistently if it had, let's say, triple the HP or quadruple the HP that it had. Another battle where speed up helps so much, man. I remember the PS2 days and just watching the 999,000 needles animation over and over and over and over again. And I did manage to win. So thankfully, low HP Cactar King meant that I could get it done. Tynus has higher luck. If you guys remember, I had been investing what little luck I got throughout the game into him, and that's why he was the one making the hits. So if I didn't give him those uh, luck spears, then we would have really struggled. A lot of ambushes here for some reason, but yeah. I kind of would have expected this guy to have armored status. It always surprised me when it didn't. So the, the Celestial weapons are completely slicing through it here. And therefore, like that sort of um, auto region that it has, it's it's not going to get the job done. We should be able to, to take it out. That said, uh, once we start getting KO'd a lot and we come back with half HP, now you can start to see that it's making a good comeback here because that regen is healing a pretty decent amount at the at the HP level that it does have. So we're only able to do about 15,000 damage um, once we've been revived. And it recovers 16,000 just from that one turn. So we, we will be able to defeat it. But again, it's a little bit grindier than I would like because obviously um, of the Celestial Weapon mechanics and the fact that our strength isn't like a mega high at this stage. But it's only a matter of time before we defeat this guy too. And so, yes, eventually I did get the win against this one as well. So still, other than Marlboro Menace, we've continued to be able to defeat every area creation so far, which is good. And so without any delay, it was time to move on to the next page and Abyss Worm. Again, I wasn't too worried. This one does have like a Quake type attack, um, but I figured it's very slow. And so we should be able to, to get the job done before it even really has a chance to do anything. So that shouldn't really matter too much here, that, that move. And well, it regurgitates the character pretty fast, which is good. And Auto Phoenix takes care of the damage. So yeah, this one is definitely one of the easiest ones to deal with, I would say. Agility makes a massive, massive difference. And we don't even have stuff like Auto Haste or SOS Haste, otherwise it would be even easier. So it's doing its best to slow the battle down, but it's just, it's not going to be enough. The only thing is if it does manage to get off like that sort of quakey type attack that it can do, then that might swing things a little bit, but we'll just have to see. But you can see with like the mechanics are really evident where like at the start of the battle, they come out the blocks flying and everyone's doing like this, these massive hits and stuff. And then as the battle goes on, because we're not able to heal, the damage output really starts to slow down. And that's pretty fascinating to see in action. Like it, everything looks like it's gonna be over in 10 seconds when you start and then it continues to sort of go on and on because the, the characters just get weaker and weaker and then uh, it's hard to kind of maintain that consistent high level of damage for an entire run. So yeah, this, this poor guy has such little HP that never going to be a problem at this stage. And well, he's a nice source of elemental protection. At this stage, it's not really necessary. Um, I can't think of too much where it's going to be really important to have elemental protection, but it is there. Another enemy that only hits one character at a time. So at this stage, even like newer players uh, to the game, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> you should have, you should get the deal by now. And you can see why, like, once you see these kind of things in action, you can see why a lot of these challenges become possible. And um, how, like, even let's say no sphere grid, you can find ways around things that you would normally think are just impossible to beat because you've got things like Auto Phoenix to help you out here. And so absolute worst case, you can just stay alive for a very, very long time because you can just keep auto phoenixing people and, uh, and getting yourself out of trouble. So now the good thing is that once it does move forward, it stops counterattacking, so things speed up a lot. 
and you can just really get the job done more quickly. So Don Tomberry is also dead, and for now, Marlborough Menace continues to be the only um, failure in the area conquest segment of the Monster Arena. Katobla Pass, another one. Um, I'm thinking, like, does it have like some kind of like Ultima Meteor? What was the deal with that? I didn't remember it too well. So we're just going to have to see. Now, this guy does have the tough armored status, and therefore, we're not able to do as much damage to it. Now, Katobla Pass, again, I remember something like 480,000 HP. Uh, could be wrong. I'll always look out for those annotations on the top right to see how much HP um, a boss has. But the damage output here is really bad. So tough uh, armor status, plus the fact that we're not going to be at full HP, means that this guy is a nuisance because it's going to be extremely grindy to try and take out all of that HP. We're only doing just over 20,000 damage per round of attacks. And that's going to fall even more now because, well, workers at half HP. So 8,000, 13,000, 17, 18,000. So getting worse and worse. And now no one's at full HP. So now 5,000. Okay, that was critical. 10,000, 8,000. Okay, okay. The criticals are kind of skewing things here, but you get the idea. And so, yes, it casts an Ultima upon defeat. And, well, you say for all the world that these guys are going to die. And they do. So, yeah, this is a problem. And, again, it's that magic defense. The Achilles heel at the moment really is that magic defense. Now, it does treat it as a win because you get the dark matter and you get the equipment. But it was kind of like a half win, I guess, against Kotobu Pass. But we'll take it at this stage. Now, Abaddon was an interesting one because I know that it has uh, a, a big attack that hits the entire party. And again, it's another one with the tough armored status. So, this one was looking like it might be a bit too much for me. So, let's see if uh, we can get it done before it kills us off. It is pretty slow, as you can see, but now it's done the mana focus. And, yeah, the, the big attack is going. Was it Emblem of the Cosmos? Yeah, okay. Here we go. Low magic defense boys here, and they got completely wiped out. Now, again, this one, if it felt to me like having more attempts was kind of pointless because I believe it's kind of pre-programmed to use it um, after like that many uh, turns. So, yeah, that was a, a no-go. So we had our second failure now against Abaddon. And Vorban, I also assumed a fail too because this one has an attack that hits the entire party and it does it regularly, so... Um, has a lot of HP, has like tough armor, so this is just not looking like uh, something that would be particularly possible. So, I think I will start to wrap things up for this comeback episode for the post-game of Final Fantasy X Auto Battle with the area conquest here. So, you've seen that I failed against Malboro Menace, against Abaddon, and against Vorban. So, that's where we're at at the moment, and in the next episode, you'll be seeing how I continue on with this. I will, of course, try to beat those guys. I will try to come back and fight them when I'm ready. But I will also be trying the species creations to see if there's anything I can defeat from that bunch. And then there's still, of course, Omega Weapon to defeat. So there's still a lot to do, but increasingly, as I get nearer and nearer the end of this series, there's going to be bigger chunks where I need to edit things out, uh, where we'll be preparing for battle, where we'll be trying to gather particular equipment, or I'll be leveling up a bit and things like that. But in terms of things that I can defeat, as you've seen, provided that you are willing to put in like the effort to get the levels that you need, and you have a little bit of know-how with your equipment and how to get certain things, you can go a very long way in this challenge. So the fact that I've even defeated a lot of the area conquest, and we still haven't cashed in a lot of the sphere levels, and we still have a lot we can do in terms of our equipment, it bodes well for the future. So I hope you guys are continuing to enjoy the series. There is definitely more to come from it. And I'm looking forward to sharing more and showing you guys what I was able to defeat in the Fire Fantasy X Auto Battle Challenge. So I will see you soon. Thank you all for the support as always. And of course, remember to check out that Patreon for early access to these videos and many other perks. I will see you soon, guys. Thanks for watching. Take care.